All right, Ready to Die was number one. But now he's like, yo, man, listen, man, I want my spot back, take two. He's seeing some money. So he's like, yo, I want, I want, you know, I want a Versace. The list of rappers that made two classics in a row is super short. You just made another classic. 26 years ago, we tragically lost one of the greatest music artists that ever lived. In the sphere of hip hop, Christopher Wallace, AKA the Notorious B.I.G., is revered as one of the greatest of all time writer, rapper, and songwriters, a GOAT. His final body of work was the impeccable double album, Life After Death, a succession of infectious hit records and impossibly poignant rhymes that soared from certified diamond to iconic. 2022 marked the year that Life After Death turned 25, as well as the year that our dear friend Big Papa would have been 50 years old. I'm Angie Martinez, the voice of New York, and I spent five consecutive nights speaking with those who were closest to Biggie during the final 18 months of his life, in and out of the studio. The result is an eight episode visual podcast fit for a king. Welcome to season one of Iconic Records. In New York City, there is no sitting on the throne without possessing a style that is as bright and flavorful as it is original. The Big Apple also loves a come-up story. While the notorious B.I.G. leveled up lyrically, his fashion climbed parallel. He ultimately became the face of Coogee sweaters and Jesus pendants. No song exemplified Big's aspirational glow on global culture more than Sky's the Limit. In episode two, we break down the beauty of Sky's the Limit with bad boy R&B group 112 and God's favorite DJ, Clark Kent. But first, we sit with the architects behind Big's evolution to fashion icon. See, before Big Papa wore Versace, he rocked pieces from Guy and Shireen Wood's custom line 5001 Flavors. Just ask superstar stylist and former bad boy intern Mike B. He was there. When it comes to Biggie's true player aesthetic, these are some of his day ones. Mike B, yeah. get on in here. Come in. What's up, baby? Hi, baby. How, How are you? I'm blessed, man. You Can't are? Can't complain. Just feeling like God in the flesh. <laughs> Just glad to be here. You know what I mean? Talk to me about how this little section makes you feel. It makes me feel like homies right here. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. This is really, really nice right here. The curation of this whole thing is really dope. Were you there for this photo shoot? I was there. That was one of the coldest days. Um, so be clear, I, I was not big stylist. Got okay? it. So during this time, I was Puff's liaison. So What does that mean? I was the intern that basically helped and assist with everything. Got it. From washing the cars, from being the driver, from being a host in the studio before Puff actually got there. And then at the same time, I was Groove's assistant, where Groovy Lou was the in-house stylist for all the artists at the boutique. So basically, I was the one that would go meet Guy from 5001 to pick up the garments, bring them to Big. That was like one eerie, like cold day. This day? Yeah, that day was kind of crazy. It was ill. But, Tell um, me about this day in this photo shoot. So I do remember, as always, Big is just always easy. Really? Big was always, Big was like probably the easiest artist ever to work with. Why? Because Big was just always so humble and he always had a big heart and he always wanted to make sure that everyone else around him was straight before he was even straight. So 
even though it'll be his shoot or his video, he's still asking, yo, you all right, dog? You straight? You good? You all right? You all right, Ma? You all right? You need anything? Just let me know you need anything. So he was always um, his own concierge to everyone else at mm -hmm. the same time, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect example. So this is one of probably my favorite big story. This is Big's last performance for Soul Train. And this is at, uh, this is when Soul Train Awards was at the Shrine Theater. So we got Big's outfit, we got all the wardrobe together, we got Puff's wardrobe together. Everything is together except for Big's shoes. Big is about to go on stage. You know, he's asking for his shoes, but He's making jokes, but in a sarcastic way, like, yo, why my shoes hang here? Mm -hmm. So Big literally took one shoe from two different security guards. And when I tell you Big literally went on stage with two different shoes on. <laughs> and mind you, Big was a size 13. One of the guards was maybe a 12, and the other one might have been a, like 11, 11 and a half. And when I tell you Big put his shoe, his foot in both of these shoes and broke them backs down like they was a pair of Adidas slides or something. <laughs> and the way he just came floating out on stage, I pop up, freaks all the honeys. Dun it was like you would never even know. So it was like, I would always say that was like probably one of my favorite moments because it showed the humility in him. And at the end of the day, it also showed the rock star of him that the show must go on mm. and I'm still going to beat this stage up. So it, that, I would probably say, yeah, that was... That's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, Let, let's talk about big style because that was a big part of, you know, the persona and, and what they represented at the time. And what can you tell me about just the style and the, and the fashion of it all? Well, what's so beautiful about big style is his lyrics and his music literally commented and ran parallel to his style of fashion and his his transition i'll say mm -hmm. because when he's when he's telling you he literally went from ashy to classy you literally see the the transition from the custom mecca soccer jerseys or the the custom leather basketball jerseys to now he's wearing the Persian lamb coats with the Persian lamb applejack to the side and you know the Versace shades is crazy. Take something as simple as the Jesus piece. Cubans with my Jesus piece, with my peeps. Like I don't remember seeing another rapper with it with a Jesus piece like that. Really? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And if there was, please forgive me. I I I just know that my man he just did it best. And he you know coined it. And, and he, he coined it. And it was yeah. just so flav. And the way he still just had it dripping over the, over the, over his Kooji or whatever the case may be. And then, you know, I just started seeing, you know, other MCs walking around with their Jesus piece. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just the way his wordplay was, you know, the way he shouted everybody out using garments, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. gators for my Detroit players and um, um, my honey's from DC with the Donna Caring, Donna's glaring, and you know, Tim's for my hooligan from Brooklyn. Yeah. Like, I, I just love how he put all of that into play. So I, I feel like, you know, he was definitely one of the best to do that. Yeah, talk to me about too, like, because the 90s and what was happening and then what Biggie represented and the name brands and the, that high-end kind of ghetto fabulous, I guess they coined that, mm -hmm. right? Around absolutely, that time. absolutely. Rest but in the, peace, but Andre Harrell. Yeah, rest in peace, of course. Um, but just like the segregation between like high-end fashion brands, because they were kind of late to the party. It wasn't like they embraced this whole thing from the beginning. And, and so talk to me a little bit about that and then what Big's role and how he kind of navigated through that and maybe you can share some of that for me. Well, the beauty of it all, if y'all really go back, Big with his size now, let's take it back a little to like the Fat Boys, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the Fat Boys, 
they they started with the Latigras and the jeans and stuff also too. They started ashy before they got classy with it. Mm -hmm. But after a while, when that bread starts coming in, you start seeing the custom designs, the Dapper Dan Gucci suits, the Louis Vuittons and the Fendi. Now they starting to wear the caps to the side and all of that and the diamond flooded gazelles and all of that. And then I would probably say the next fly fashion icon of size was would probably be Hev. Mm -hmm. So with Hev, you know, starting out with the Nike Court Forces and the sweatsuits, the Sergio Cicchini, you know, which also left room for big, but to go a little step further with it now, more fashion forward. Now we're doing the silk Versace shirts and the, and the salmon linen with the salmon gaiters. That was just the epitome of fly. What know? was the, who had the vision? Was, because a lot of people credit Puff or maybe it's groovy, like, who had the vision for this? And was he, because he was he really into fashion or he was just down for the... It was both. Yeah. Big, Big just always wanted to look good. Big always had, you know, if it was, you know, the, the low with the Thames, if he had on, you know, um, the hockey jerseys, or if he had on, he was always coming Carl Kanai down. He was always walk away down. He was always rocking April stuff. Um, so, you know, Big always knew how to put it together on that street fly hustler look like. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But, yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, this whole thing was Puff's vision. Mm -hmm. Man, listen, yo, this kid changed the game between him and Puff. Especially with the fashion, not, it's not just the music. Like, what makes an artist is also your appearance. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Because even if you take it back, like for me, Coogee Rap was like one of my favorite like hardcore rappers. I loved I, I loved, loved I loved Rakim, yeah. don't get me wrong, but G-Rap was like yeah, just so ill with it, right? But the way G-Rap used to dress during my hustling days, I wanted to dress like G Rap. Yeah. I wanted to come on the block with the wool rich, with the with the um with the with the wool rich rig rom um scully. bucket and all of that on and the scully with the Syracuse patch on the side and all that, like and the and the chuckers and the Tims. Like, I wanted to look like G Rap. You understand what I'm saying? So big coming out with the Kooji sweater and the and the Jesus piece and the Versace shades and your man got the pinky ring on and the charms around the gold bracelet. Yo, that's fly. That's that's detail. And I just think the way, you know, Puff's vision and with Guy Woods tailoring from 5001 mm -hmm. and Groove bringing the style to fruition for us all to see and, you know, just connecting the dots, it's like, it was like all really like a, a trifecta between those three. Whenever I interviewed Big, he always had something fly on. Coogee sweater, some fly shades, just always look clean and put together. But we cannot truly document Big's style transition without speaking to the creators behind his initial custom look. Shireen and Guy Wood, come on down. <laughs> Hi, guys. How you doing? Angel? Welcome. Bless. How you doing? Good, man. So happy to have you. Thank you so much for doing okay. this. Great to be here. Okay, yeah. so just give me like a little... Um, intro to the history of 5001 and then Big's connection to it. Wow. Hmm. 5001 was started in the early 90s. I would say 1990. Mm -hmm. Custom clothing company. But then we geared it towards the big man because I saw that it was a, a niche. It was a, no one, no one was catering to them. Mm -hmm. So I would go and, you know, I would go to the parties and I would, you know, introduce myself to all the big guys, Prince Marky D, Heavy D, then Notorious Big. So how did you meet Big? Was the first time you met Big? Um, well, I met Big when I was working at Uptown, doing stuff at Uptown Records, where mm -hmm. I met Puff, and um, Andre brought us in to do stuff for Heavy D. Mm -hmm. So we was doing Heavy D, and we was doing a phenomenal job, and then Puff pulled me to the side and said, listen, I just got fired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I just got fired. I got a situation guy coming up. 
and I think it would be great for you. I got this artist, and then he, he told me about Big, and he said, yo, I want him to be the biggest drug dealer looking guy out there. <laughs> I want him to be a boss, not a guy on the corner. I want him to be the guy, you know what I'm saying, that mm -hmm. calls the shots. I said, I got you. I got you. And what that's was, how it was done. What was the first thing you put him in? Um, well, the first thing was something light. We did like a, a cream denim shirt with denim pants. Right. And then the first video was the Juicy. Yeah. Yeah, we did Juicy. And Juicy, he had the leather jersey and the, and the leather shirt. We just wanted to start him off lightly because we had the direction that he was going to be this big guy, but you just can't come out being a big drug dealer looking. You got <laughs> to grow. You got to grow. You got to be a corner boy. You got to be a runner. You got to, got the public got to believe in you. You got to go from ashy to classy. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. of course. Exactly. So how how involved was Big in that look? Like, was that Puff kind of um, doing the direction? Or was in, the, in the beginning, it was Puff. Mm. It was Puff. Puff would tell me like, yo, we got three looks for him. We want a denim look, and I want some leather. I said, what about a jersey? Say bad boy on it. He said, oh, okay, I'm cool with that. At that time, we didn't have a color for bad boy. So I said, you know, Puff would always wear the pirate hat with the P on it. So I said, let me give him the yellow with the black and white. He said, that's cool. At that time, we didn't even measure Big. Big was like, yo, I think I'm a 2X. That's why the jersey was a little tight. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? We didn't, wasn't even measuring. We was going on site, looking at you and saying, okay, if you say you're a 40, we'll give you a 40. When did you start seeing, when did the evolution of his look start happening? After we did Juicy, and then we started doing photo shoots. We did the photo shoot for Junior Mafia. And he came out with the leather pea coat with the gold Versace buttons and the, and the Kango hat with the Versace shades. And then he dressed everyone in Junior Mafia. Yeah. In, in, in different color, like polo windbreaker, but in leather. Mm -hmm. And they came off the private plane. He had the two twins with him. Or... He came off the helicopter. Yeah. He's probably initially more silent because he wanted whatever we wanted. Right. Um, Heavy was like really influential, told him, you know, they're, they're, they're gonna hook you up. So I think he was really trusting at that point. But I also think when he brought out Junior Mafia, I think it was for the source when he had to yeah. in the helicopter. Yeah. The first time we kind of saw Kim, um, I think at that point he became a visionary and I think he saw the vision. I think yeah. initially he just was like, make me fly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, then he transitioned, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and what, what happened was now the music is coming out. Mm -hmm. So you're hearing the lyrics. And I'm pulling him to the side. I said, bro, we got we got to get busy. Like, you talking about all this stuff. You you know, you got this, you got that. We ain't got nothing. Like, we, <laughs> we got to at least look the part. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We got to look the part. And what's so crazy, with that, when they call me for the suit, that was the first time he ever wore a suit. I don't know what he's wearing it for. I don't. I don't ask. I, right. I just make the white three-piece suit. Yeah. And he'd never worn a suit before, right? Never. We yeah. never even thought of a suit. But then he, at one point, he was like, he's he's seeing some money. So he's like, yo, I want, I want, you know, I want a Versace. Speed. And color. Remember, he yeah. wore that red. Um, after he wore that red uh, jacket in the vibe on the cover with Faith, it was, it was over. He was open for anything. Yeah. Salmon. Um, right yeah. gators and so that was for me an evolution just seeing what he wanted and what he was comfortable in. Mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing is watching him do it but then the whole mass from new york to la people wearing hats they wearing silk shirts mm -hmm. everything changed yeah everybody's wearing dress slacks gators everybody's a player now yeah so. It's crazy because we talk. They talk so much about fashion and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and there was such like a big, it's a segregation between like high end fashion right. and brands, and hip hop mm -hmm. artists. Yeah. Um. He probably was not even. Well, number one, they weren't making the size. No, they weren't making the size. I never really pushed it because that's that's excellent for us as the custom company. Yeah. Versace and all these brands didn't think that they want to see a three X person in their clothing. Mm. So I'm saying that's the only people that can afford your clothing in our community is the football, basketball, and the rapper, the big guys. Yeah. So if you don't want to make it for, for them, I'll make it for them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> so he screams out, Versace, Versace. Only thing he had for Versace was the glasses. Yeah. Everything else was 5,001. Yeah. Was it intentional for Big, that transition from, you know, from Ashy to Classy yeah, 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 yeah. into Frank White? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah. intentional for him? It was yeah. intentional, yes. What happened was, in the beginning, the first album, Puff had a lot of control. By the second album, not so much. Me and, me and, me and Big would meet privately and discuss his looks for his shows, for the image that he wanted. He said, guy, I got I got Detroit, I got Chicago, I got this. Yeah, once he said the ladies loved it, he loved it. Yeah. So I would never think that he would want baby blue yeah. suede outfits that would yeah. make in burgundy. These are like all the really great iconic images that have been on like album covers. And mm -hmm. he loved a color. He's like, you know, yeah. I, I'm big, black and ugly, but they got to see me. So yeah. put me in something where they can see me. No, he once he started getting a few dollars, he was not ugly oh, anymore. No. The girls went crazy for Yes, him. and he loved that. And his confidence <laughs> was on one million, so it was like... Uh, do you, you have know? a favorite time that you dressed him, a favorite outfit? Mm, I think he did, um, I don't know if it was Palladium. He had like salmon pants with salmon gaiters and a salmon in yeah. a multicolored shirt. That was like when he was at his peak. Mm. Because we, I bring the swatch, I bring the shoe, He's like, yeah, do it, let's do it. He was in total control of his career. So that at that point, I'm like, yo, even when we got to, to the Hypnotize video, when we doing suits, Puff had to call like, yo, what, which, what, what, what we doing? But by that time, Puff is like, no, I need the same suit as him. Puff's, and then Big was like, don't tell him I'm getting double-breasted. <laughs> like, we're not gonna look like kid and play. You know what I'm saying? You were talking earlier about how his, um how he liked to dress for the ladies. Like, he would like to impress the lady. If they liked it, he loved it. Yes, but he also, <laughs> you know, he said, I'm, I'm trying to put it down for the big guys. You know, first, have put it down with the, you know, overweight lover. Mm -hmm. And so I think Big was like, I'm trying to represent for all the big, black, ugly guys. And I was like, stop saying that. He was like, no, we don't get no love. <laughs> like, he was like, you know, we, we love, you know, to be appreciated. We love to look good. And we, you know, have got it down for the, the light skin brothers. But I got rep for the, for the other guys. So I was happy that he was happy. But the ladies loving it was important. But he was also like, I, I want the fellas to get like, I want the fellas to feel good and look mm -hmm. good and wear colors. Mm -hmm. I, I never thought that um, he was a ladies' man, he would tell me. I, I mean, you know, I was in the office. I wasn't really out, you know, at the things. But <laughs> he wasn't in the streets watching it all go down? He wasn't in the streets. But the response was like, he was like, yo, they really love me. Like, every time he would come back, uh, you know, fix his clothes or, or do something, he would always tell me, like, yo, they can't get enough of, of big. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like this. You know, like, did he talk about himself in third person? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, yes, he did. Um, and so... You listen to his Sky's the Limit, that line about, um, I'm going to get like Tiana college playing so she doesn't need any man. Mm -hmm. Those were like kind of forward thinking conversations that he was having. Like that was a different, like a lighter big. He had money, you know, mm -hmm. money in his pocket and was starting to take care of his mom. And so it was an evolution from the guy that was wearing a tight, juicy jersey to this guy who was ultimately a millionaire and building a legacy for his family. So that was a different, yeah. a different big to work with. Mm. Big didn't just rhyme about aspiration. He lived it. Yet whenever he did rap about manifesting his dreams, he ended up making classics like Juicy or the universally beloved Sky's the Limit. Clark! Yes, dear. There is no way we have this conversation and you are not part of this. It's an honor. Again, I, I still say it's an honor to be here and especially to be here with my friend. But let's educate today a little bit. Take me back to the beginning of the What's the Clark Kent Biggie book was made? What is the first chapter? Um, I think the first chapter would have to be written with Un. Because Un was like, yo, you got to come here, my man. You got to come here, my man, and rumblings. and Because you're already DJ Clark Kent. Yeah. You're already. For a long time. <laughs> Talk your shit, though, a little bit. No, nah, just, I've been around for a little bit, you know. <laughs> you I was are a, Clark Kent. I, I was definitely being DJ Clark Kent, playing all the clubs and playing radio and doing all of that. But, um. Un's like, yo, you gotta hear my man. So I, I go around and he introduces me to this guy. And I'm just like, oh nah, he's crazy. When well, I'm tell hearing, me, don't slow me down. He introduces you. Tell me about this day. Um I, I it was summer. 
It was warm. Okay. And I get out there and he brings me to, to his block and he's like, yo, this is DJ Clark Kent. Like, yeah, I know I heard of you. And I was like, no, nah, but I'm hearing about you right now. So I, I, I just want to hear you rap. And this is like before all of the Mr. C and all that thing. I just was like, I need to hear what he's talking about. And then when he started rapping, I was like, oh, this is going to be a problem. Like, it's really going to be a problem when somebody figures it out. With what him. did he rap for you, though, that made you feel like that? He just he just rapped street tales. But to me, a lot of people rap and they, a lot of people talk about things that happen in the street. But 99% of the people who rap and talk about things in the street, you don't walk away believing. You look at it like that's just rap. It was storytelling. Right. But if I walk away believing you, and I'm only speaking about me, pers for, uh, myself. If, if I walk away and I believe everything that you said, you're going to be a special rapper. Mm. You know what I mean? And I just, I just, and that's what happened. I believed everything he said and I was like, if somebody gets their clutches on this guy and it, he's going to be special. And first rap, you knew that. Yeah, yeah. Like same with Jay. Like first time I heard Jay, I was like, oh my God, if 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 I ever get to, it's gonna be some shit. Yeah. Like I heard Biggie and was just like, this, this dude is gonna be serious. Just because I believed everything he said. So then, you know, um party and bullshit hits. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not crazy. Like he's he's special. Mm -hmm. And then um it's time for the album to come out and Juicy and Unbelievable drop, and now he has to do shows. And 50 Grand was his DJ, and I think, um, I guess because I might have been more polished at the moment, and I had done a bunch of tours already with other artists, um, Mark and, um, and Puff were like, yo, you, you got a DJ for big. And um, I was like, okay, cool, but he's got to trust me when it comes to how to make a show. Like the next day, Big was at my house. And we were making a show and he was like, whatever you say, we're going to do it. And I was like, just like that. And he was like, you've been doing this. And right then and there, I was like, OK, he trusts me. So he let me create his show based off of two or three records. And then when the album came out, we were on tour. Wow. Yeah. So what did you create that day? Like, what is <laughs> what is the thing? Um, what was the first like thing you were like, this is what you got to do? Because was he a good performer at the beginning? No, no artist is a good performer at the beginning, <laughs> okay. um, which is which is 100 percent fair because they're not performers. They're rappers or singers first and then they have to become performers. Mm. You know what I'm saying? The one thing that he had was what you heard on the record, you would hear on the mic at a show. So it wasn't. It wasn't like oh, he doesn't sound good on the mic. No, no. He sounded amazing at shows. So that just made it easier for me to do other things. So like dipping other tracks inside of a track to make a different energy happen at a mm -hmm. certain time. So a lot of that was, yo, okay, we, we're going to do freestyle here. We're going to do, you're going to do it this rhyme over here and do this rhyme on this. And we're going to, so like when you hear it, um, when the album drops and every time we perform, you hear me and my bitch, it's on computer love instead of being on the, on the record he made. It's yeah. because I was like, let's do it to computer love. And then all of a sudden, later on, when we when we perform the show for the movie to show, when you hear Clark Kent one time, it's me cutting up computer love because that's what we did on tour. I was like, you got to do it to this because it's going to be iller. And he, he just trusted it. Did he ever push back on anything? No. Never. Yeah. Yes. OK, tell he me did. One. Tell um, me a big, good, big story. He pushed back from the beginning on performing Juicy. Why? He he didn't necessarily love Juicy to really? perform it. Like he didn't want to perform it. And I like, I mean, you need to know, like this is when Juicy is at the epitome of all rap records is Juicy. And we're going on stages and he's like, man, I don't want to do that record. I'm like, dog, you have to do the record, yeah. right? Cool, we do the record and in the middle of the record, he cuts it off. Yo, 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 turn that off. And in my mind, I'm going, we're going to get booed. And instead of getting booed, they just started throwing it at the stage. <gasps> And I started the record over. I'm like, you got to perform the record. But like they were throwing things at the stage and I was like, it's the record. That's the record. That's the reason why you are on tour right now is because of that. It's not unbelievable. Unbelievable is why you could tour New York City. Mm. But you can't tour the world unless you're doing this record. Man, I don't... Dog, do the f***ing record. <laughs> like I'm on stage going, do the f***ing record. And then he did the record and, you know, by the end of the song, everybody's, you know, man. And I'm just like, gotta, you, 
This is the record. Yeah. We're here because of this. When did the point come where you talked about actually making? You went from the DJ to the consultant to the well, we're gonna, we gonna make a record. Were you like, did you was it like, did you know like I gotta get a record on this guy? Like, did you feel like that? It's funny because I never felt like that because I don't think I got the moment to because I was working on Jay's album. Even though I was on the road with him, I would come back, we work on Jay's album. And, and it was what it was. So my consumption was working on him, but he was like, yo, bring me some beats. So I'm just like, okay. I'm not knowing why he's asking for beats, but in my mind, I'm thinking, dog, we're on tour. You're not going in the studio. I bring him some beats. First, first one that comes on is play his anthem. And he just vibing. And all of a sudden I hear, that's like, that's how he's mumbling it. And I'm going, oh, we're about to have a record. <laughs> but I thought it was just going to be his record. And he goes, yo, next stop, we're going to go home and make this one. And I'm like, okay, cool. We get to the studio and all the kids are there. Junior Mafia is there. And I was like, hey, good to see y'all. He, he you goes didn't know in. Junior Mafia was going to be on the record? I didn't know they were going to be, I didn't know it was going to be their record right. at all because he didn't say anything. But we get in there and we start recording and he's saying a verse and then he goes, sees, go do the verse. And I'm like, wait, what are we doing? He was like, oh, we're going to make a Junior Mafia album. And I was like, we? He was like, yeah, me and you. We're going to make Junior Mafia album. And I was just like, oh, these kids can't rap. He was like, <laughs> he was like, don't worry, they'll be fine. And that's the point where I had to trust him. They couldn't rap at all at that point? Not only Kim. Kim could rap. Yeah. Yeah. Kim was a ra Kim was a rapper. Nobody else rapped. Not, nah. No. <laughs> they were they was his man's. It was his man's. The, the funny thing is, they came around really quick. The only person in Junior Mafia who could rap and rap for real was Kleptomaniac. He was nice, mm. like dead nice. Mm. You what know, do you think about, because I don't think that's spoken about enough, what that says about him? What that says about him is that he had vision beyond his vision. You know what I'm saying? He didn't just see what was for him. He saw was what he could do outside of himself. It's very few artists that could put on another artist who's going to be as good as or comparable to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, I look at Lil Wayne like he's a genius for putting on Drake and Nicki Minaj because how many artists at that level put on an artist that's going to be at their level? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so the, the genius of Rockefeller having Kanye West is like amazing because like this guy was really going to be as big as the main guy here. Mm -hmm. And the main guy has to be okay with that. But so many egos get get bruised up when they see somebody else taking some light that there's artists who just can't see the greatness in another artist properly. I would say that the difference in that is that Drake was his own artist and Wayne lifted him up, put him out. Who else did you mention? Nicki Minaj. No, you said somebody else that put somebody, oh, Jay. Mm -hmm. Kanye was his own artist. So 100%. Jay, Biggie was taking his talent yeah. and infusing them yeah, that into was... kids that didn't even rap. Right. So Big lays the, the, the he lays the song down. Yeah, right? he it's, lays... it's known that he writes, yeah. did all these songs. I mean, there's some of the references actually leaked. Yeah, right? yeah, some of the references. Which is always weird to hear uh, Biggie saying the yeah. some of those little yeah. kid lyrics. <laughs> it's always so nice. Yeah. Well, did that surprise you in the moment? In the moment, it surprised me, but then, it, it, like, as soon as he goes, sees, go do your verse, like, I'm, I'm putting it together, okay, this is what he really wants to do, let's see what happens. As Soon as the record was done, we took the, the tape to a mastering lab, like a dat to a mastering lab, pressed up the tape, uh, pressed up, like, a few copies, and brought it to the tunnel. I give the record to Flex and, um, and Big Cat. Nobody's ever heard this song. Nobody's ever heard the song, and the crazy part is, in my heart, I know Flex isn't going to play it. He's not going to. No, because he had a rival with me, a rivalry with me then. Mm. But I knew Cat would play it, so I had to give it to both. I gave it to him, I'm like, yo, this is new record with Biggie and his group. And he's like, okay. But then I give it to Cat, I'm like, yo, it's new Biggie and his group. He's like, word? Bang! Rings off in the tunnel. He plays it like 10 times in a row. 
Now, me and Biggie are standing against one of the walls in the tunnel. LL Cool J's walking by, and the club's going crazy. And he goes, I'm like, yo, what's up? So he's like, yo, what is this? I was like, it's a new joint with, with Big and his, his crew. He was like, who did this? I was like, I did. He was like, yo, dog, I need a joint like that. I said, remember that white, that, that tape I gave you with the silver label on it? That was the first one on the tape. And he was like, this? I was like, yeah, you had it first. You had it before Jay. You had it before all the guys that, that, that you had any rivalries with. You had it first. I shouldn't have gave it to you, but I did. I said, but you had it first and you didn't pick it. I said, so now you hear it in the club. And he was just like, damn. I was like, yeah, listen to the tape. Because on that same tape. So he never listened to the tape. Right? I don't think he listened to it properly. Yeah. You know, because not all MCs can hear a, a track and hear the whole song. Mm. Biggie hear the track, he hears the whole song. Most people hear the track and they think, how do I rhyme to it? Biggie's like, oh no, there's a whole song here. The next track on there was Sky's the Limit. He missed that. LL had a chance LL to have Players, had anthem, players anthem and Sky's, and Sky's the, limit. the Limit. And then it was magical because the tunnel was upside down that night. And I was just like, we did this yesterday. This shit shouldn't even be playing. But it's me, Big, and Un. And Un's like, yo, this is going to be the first single. And Big's like, I told you, Clark, told you. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, you told me. And then we go back on the road like two days later. You stepping into Life After Death studio as the king of New York with the crown on your head. Did that change him? I wouldn't say it changed his approach. I just looked at it like he was just trying to make amazing records. And because he could look at his original body of work and go, those were amazing records, he can go, oh, all I got to do is do that again. Because if you look at every album that you think is a classic album, like the real classics, the, the, the NWA, the Ice Cube, the Snoop Dogg first album, the Child Called Quest joint, Slick Rick's album. Chronic. Chronic. I, don't, I can't even put the Chronic before I put Snoop Dogg's album. But I know, it's debatable. I Snoop, mean, for some. Snoop Dogg's album better than the Chronic. Anyway, it definitely is. That's not even a question. But, 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 but <laughs> what I'm saying is, if you take a second and listen to all of those albums, Reasonable Doubt, Life After Death, Ready to Die, they're the same album. All of these albums do the same thing. They begin, they hold you in the middle, they hug you, and then they end. That's what classic albums do. But you got to have great songs that make that thing happen. If you don't, you get one song that doesn't hit properly, you done took yourself out of the classic thing. Because if you can skip, you ain't got a classic. Mm. That's why I won't say The Chronic is a classic. Because I can skip RBX. Well, what did you think when you first heard the full life after death? Being friends, I heard it early. First of all, you hear 10 songs and you're thinking, oh, God, it's crazy. And then you hear 15 and you're like, all right. It's written. But then you're like, wait a minute, you got more? He's like, yeah, it's a double album. So we just listen, listening to everything. And I'm just like, damn, there's no skips. And I said that to him. He was like, what do you mean? I said, I can't skip anything that I'm hearing, even the interludes, like I can't skip anything. And he's like, is that good? I was like, that's amazing. And I said to him, yo, the list of rappers that made two classics in a row is super short. Mm. You just made another classic. And he was just like, word. I was like, yeah. So we finished Sky's the Limit. And at the end of the session, he goes, this is my favorite record. Yo, as far as I'm concerned, I quit. I don't have to do nothing after that. You, you hear the stories where he's talking about the robberies or the deaths here or the killing here and the, the selling crack here. And the, but then he turns around and the only record he makes where he's like, I'm going to tell you about myself is Sky's the Limit. That's some ill shit. That's the only record where he was like, well, let me, let me tell you a little bit about me from kid days. 88 Oshkosh and Blue and White Dunks passed the blunt. Oh, he said Oshkosh. You know what I'm saying? Like, we said, I'm telling you, when, when I was in the studio and that went down, I was like, come on. He said Oshkosh, Blue and White Dunks. Yes, that was 88. Blue and White Dunks and Oshkosh and overalls. That's what we were. Like, you said that. I love you. Right now, I fucking love you. <laughs> so, uh, give me a little about Sky's the Limit in that session and 
well, that song coming to life. It's funny because when we first started recording Sky's the Limit, Biggie sung the hook. Oh, it was like he, he, he laid it down. He sung the hook. He laid it down. And then 112 came and That must and have sounded it. nuts. No, it sounded amazing. Did it? Yes. Where is it, that? It's His voice is in between in between 112. I didn't take it out. I just put it low. So in, in my ear, I could listen to it and go, there's Biggie right there. You know, but that's because I mix the songs. So it's like. I have to re-listen to this. You're, you're, you're probably not going to hear it the I same way. I will hear it now. Now, if like if you listen to Brooklyn's Finest, the song, the the track in the track, it goes ah, dun, 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 ah. Biggie sings the ah, shut up, in part of the record, and I just like I'm gonna leave that there, cause he loved the track. He was just ah, ah. he kept singing it. And I was just like, I'll keep that, and I just kept it. Wow. Yeah, it, things that- like that happen. And so he sang the hook on Sky's the Limit. He sang the hook on Sky's the Limit. And then later when it came to mixing, he was like, I put 112 on the record. And I was just like, okay, cool. But when I was mixing, I kept hearing his voice. So I just left it in a little bit. So, a little bit. Just yeah, enough. Just a little bit. For me. Yeah. For me to be like, there's Biggie right there. Of course, Biggie's favorite song on Life After Death would feature his favorite R&B group. It's time we wrap this wonderful episode by giving you access to Room 112. Room 112, where the players dwell. Yep. Did you have any, I'm sure that line follows you your whole life, no? Listen, from the beginning of our whole career, every time we go to a hotel, it doesn't matter. We know y'all want Room 112. I was like, all of us don't fit in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, that's the last place oh, we want to be. No sleep. Yeah, nah, no sleep. No sleep. Nah. Tell me about the, the first time you met Big. What that ex- what that experience was like? Oh man, funny got a funny story about that. So when we first met Big, we were at Daddy's house, right? And he was in the kitchen, and like you know how Daddy's house, the kitchen is like dumb small, right? So he's yeah. a, he's on the opposite side of the counter, and we're walking in, and it's like a assembly line of us, right? And so he was like, "Yo, what up? Yo, what up? Yo, what up? Yo, what up? Yo, it's a hundred and twelve of you." That was just his mindset, but he was always just joking and just laughing with us, man. He just, it was just a real, just awesome vibe just to be around this dude. His energy just, just filled the room, you know what I mean? And, and we, we just wanted to, to be like dude, you know what I mean? We just wanted to have that same kind of energy when we stepped in the room. It's like, you knew we was here and Big was that dude, you know what I mean? Talk to me about your first your first Yo. session with Big. Oh my goodness! So, <laughs> big shouts out to Junior Mafia. Hey, listen. <laughs> hey man. Hey we sh- hey we were doing um we were recording uh only you the remix. So right. so so we already got the original version. You know what I mean? But we got Stevie. You got Stevie J in the building. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like and he's in there. He's he playing with the um he playing with the bass guitar. So meanwhile, you gotta understand like any, anywhere there's Biggie. Junior Mafia is right there. Right. What's up, Felicis? Hey, man, they were smoking us up out of that bad boy. Like, <laughs> so first of all, this is supposed to be an R&B right. situation. We don't, you know what I'm saying? At that time, we don't smoke. Uh, we yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? Smoke. Yeah, so it was just like, man, we, we're in there and smoked out. Cats in there just having a good time. They just talking about all kind of stuff. Out of <laughs> smoking <laughs> you out? <laughs> smoked us out. Yeah, but how crazy is that? You, you're these young R&B cats from Atlanta, and your introduction to New York is at a time when New York hip hop is thriving and then you step into this and your big brother is uh, Notorious B.I.G. who put his arms around you. What a wild introduction to New York music scene. Yeah, it was it was crazy because, like you said, like the music scene, like New York was popping at that, at that time. You know what I mean? So Atlanta was still trying to just we were trying to find our footing, you know what I mean? We were trying to get a foothold into the industry. Like we had Outkast at that point, we had Goody Mob, and but we we just weren't, you know, that that mainstay yet, like it is right now and stuff. So the good thing about Big, like everybody followed Big's lead. So if Big was like, "Yo, they cool," then we would everybody, like, "Yo, they cool," you know what I mean? And, and mm-hmm. yo, I want them to be on this record, you know. Then we was cool. on that record. Um, funny story that. What's that on uh, that I got a story to tell, right? This goes to the story that Slim was talking about, right? So we go we got a session, right? 
sees come in, yo, Big's in the other room. I want to holler. He want to holler at you. Now keep in mind, we are now already experienced the smoke act. <laughs> so we like, bro, we're not gonna sing tonight, man. It's like we just gonna go in there holler at him because, like, bro, we ain't get no singing done, you know, at, at this point, right? So we go in, smoke from from your from your thighs up. Right? Yeah. <laughs> just, you 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 can't see nobody, right? All you see is the silhouettes of everybody and stuff, right? So it's big junior mafia, the engineer. That poor dude. Poor <laughs> that poor dude. Poor engineer. Yeah, he had been in there for like eight hours already. Just smoked <laughs> out his mind. So we go up and we, you know, we see Big, what up? And they're playing, I got a story to tell. You know, dun, 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 dun. you know what I'm saying? So that's just going, right? Sees being himself, Junior Mafia in there, wilding, drinks everywhere. Big ain't said nothing. Said nothing, done nothing. He's just sitting in that chair, just sitting there smoking right so around about 4 a.m 4 a.m the dude got yeah. up and he was like i'm ready i'm ready yeah and the engineer was like ready ready for what <laughs> <laughs> so all the while big was listening to everybody's like just yeah. wilding everybody talking everybody wilding you know, keep in mind this this dude is the first dude that I saw that never wrote anything down. Not, not one word. Yeah, all nothing. these rappers talking about, you know, like they don't write anything down. Big was the first cat I saw that never wrote anything down. Him and Faith Evans. Yeah. Faith never wrote anything down either. So he gets up going to the booth and he he creates I got a story to tell. And I'm like, yo, man, we are around genius, bro. You know, he got the, my 112 CD blast. You know, it, like he because we were in the room with him. What was so amazing for us and, and just humbling for us was how he shouted us out so many times. You wow. know what I mean? It was just, it was like this dude really wow. loved 112. Give me a give me a couple of them. Tell me a couple of them, your favorites. I need the line. I need the oh, 112. Oh, you talking about what he said about 112. Uh yeah, yeah. Give yeah, me a my, 112. He said, lines. My 112 CD blast, roll the grass. He came first, I came last, right? Then it was the other one. Um he was he said, uh, shut up, 112, what's shaking? And then so it um uh, and then um, uh, what's the one that da, 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 da. he's like go to room one twelve. So it was just a whole yeah, lot of him, you know what I mean. Blanco was, sent you. Yeah, yeah tell yeah. Blanco sent you. So it was, yeah. it was it was like oh my. I was God. like wow, this man, this man who's 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 known to the world as the greatest ever, is calling our names over and over again. But it, what's crazy <laughs> about it is like, hey, we did hang out with him all the time. He had so much respect for us. I was like, man, why he have us hanging? He could have hung up with any of the cool cat. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, yeah, but we were still you, trying to figure we, it out. Yeah, you know we, I mean? you know, we, we, we were still trying to tie. I got the timbos right, on, right? right. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about Sky's the Limit because um, Clark told me that Biggie laid the original singing parts down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, so tell me he, about that he, session. He tell me about us. walking in. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, we saw him at the bat. We we saw him at the Bat Boy office. Yep. And he he basically mm -hmm. said, "Hey, hey, check this out. I got this idea in my head." And then he starts trying to sing it. We know where you trying so to go. So we, we know where you're trying to go. And so we were like, "Okay." So when we hear the track, we know what to do. Mm -hmm. So once we went to the studio, he did one better. He laid he laid it <laughs> he, down. He, he laid it down, and he was singing. I said, "Yo, this dude is man, really serious about singing." I said, "You know part. what, man? We should have left his <laughs> we should have left his vocals in there man, with us." It, it, that was yeah. some, that was some funny well, shit. Well, I don't know if you know this, but Clark told me that if you listen closely, that he did in a couple of parts leave Big in there. Oh, he probably the did. Mix. Yeah, big shots oh. out to Clark yeah, Kent, yeah, boy. I'm sure he did. Yeah, yeah, man. How did Big sound on that? No, I, I'm sure he's on a big. It's sure you do everything you know you can. He <laughs> <laughs> sounds like really a rap nigga trying to sing. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you know, yeah. hey, but but it was yeah. flat though. It, it was, was dope flat. though. You know? Yeah, but a lot of people talk about how he would put songs together, not just rap on them. He would really be able to like, and so that's a great, yeah. I guess. Uh, Example of that. Yeah. But I'm sure you've seen that multiple times, right? All yeah. the time. All the time, man. That was a testament to his genius. You know, it was like he he knew exactly what he wanted to do, you know, with with um with his with the with the song and, and the structure of it and stuff, man. And he actually made it easier for us to, you know, work with him and stuff, because he already had the skeleton down. Mm -hmm. You know, we just had to come mm -hmm. in and just, you know, put our uh, put our one twelve on it. So we're talking a lot about this album about life after death and what, what do you what do you remember thinking when you first heard it? Thought it was a masterpiece. Like it's just like one of those first 
body of work, musical body of work, where you can listen to it from beginning to end and it felt mm -hmm. like a movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Man, he's about to be out of here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, he was already a larger than life, but this is crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, mm. I mean, yeah, and we're crazy. blessed. Blessed yeah. to be a part of it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, How man. many songs we had on there? Like three? Yeah, like, we, we was mentioned on, you know, a couple of records and, and then and then we sung on like... Um, um, no, one yeah. was produced and then you had Missing You Missing and you. then uh, Sky's the Limit. Sky's the Limit, yep. If there's no B.I.G., where do, you, where do you think... Where do you think your careers are? Do you think significantly all the man said yeah. on our first song that went goes triple platinum room 112 where the players dwell stash more cash than burt padel in hell, hell make, make you feel good, good like tony tony tony, tony. get up in your middle, middle like moni like she don't Moni's. know me but she's setting up to blow me uh, yo, yo style sliding off with the homie i mean look he described us player stays flourishing game so, so tight, tight they, they call it version come on now yo he come just, on, he man. literally on the first joint let the world know exactly what 112's flavor was yeah. so if this man did not say this i i'm pretty sure we would have been cool we would have been all right but that right there i mean good lord for i mean i could think of some other groups you know what i'm saying who came out their single was i uh, you know yeah, i mean yeah. the first the, yeah, i mean y'all didn't but y'all didn't have the king of new step. york on your on your record it is what it is somebody's got to die yo that story right there is Getting crazy. He used to, you know, he would always say he was ugly, blah, blah, blah. But so I said to him, I was like, you should wear a suit. You should dress up. If you're going to say that, you know, you should wear what other people aren't wearing. You should be dressed up. You shouldn't wear a sweatsuit. She had a miscarriage. I'm sorry. And um, he was like, that baby's lost. It might not have been yours. 